2021. Uh, first order of business is the roll call. We'll start from my left, please. Vance Garwood. Gary Israel. Eric Peterson. Jim Anders. Thank you, everybody. And we'll move on to item number three, the minutes from the August 17th, 2021 meeting. Uh, so if anybody has any questions or comments, now's the time. Otherwise, I'll look for a motion to approve those minutes. Mr. Chairperson, I, Gary Israel, make a motion that we approve the minutes from August 17th, 2021 for the Planning Commission and Board of Zoning Appeals. Motion made by Gary. I'll second that motion. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Item number four, the committee and staff report, as well as the potential residential development report and building permit activity. Uh, is that you, Les? We provided you with a copy of that report of the building permit activity. This year, we're, we're down across the board 15 or 20 percent. Uh, there are some subdivisions that have been a little slow to get started post-COVID, post additional phases, but the activity has picked up over the summer, but we'll still finish down a little bit from, from uh, recent trends. Tell you, Shadow Rock is just blown up. There are eight houses being built mm -hmm. right now. Anything else? Any other questions on that? Les, thank you. All right, we'll move on to the meat of the agenda. Mr. Uh, Chairperson, please, Gary. I'll make a motion that we recess the Planning Commission and convene the Board of Zoning Appeals. Thank you, Gary. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Tim Thank you, Tim. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? We will now convene the Board of Zoning Appeals with item number 5.1 which is the conditional use extension at 405 North Andover Road, case number BZA-CU-2021-01. Uh, staff, Les, want to lead us into this one? It's I'll go pretty straightforward. This one. Sure, it's pretty straightforward. You may remember about six months ago at 405 North Andover Road, that's Andover Square, uh, Andover Wine and Spirits came in for a drive through. They had a conditional use that was approved by the Board of Zoning Appeals. Um, no activity has happened on that uh, uh, drive through window. Um, so they are requesting an extension this evening. That extension doesn't require a public hearing, you can just approve it outright. Uh, the applicant, Mr. Bob Kaplan of Andover Square, could not make it tonight. Uh, he uh, has a few mobility issues, but he mentioned uh, there, uh, via phone kind of the process and where he's at with that. And, and he stated that uh, um, it is still the uh, tenant's intent to continue with a drive through on the site. Uh, however, he's prioritizing other things at the moment and is just requesting a six month, 180 day extension. Thanks, Justin. Sure. Um, obviously, the applicant's not here, and you kind of you spoke on his behalf. So um, I have a question. Uh, so no red flags or anything. Just we haven't got to it yet. Correct. Yeah, we haven't gotten to it yet. Uh, we were uh, reviewing the site plan for that property, and and it fizzled out a little bit just because I know that the, the 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 tenant just wasn't moving forward on it. So this would basically allow us to continue those discussions on the drive through. It's it's based on the use. So you're you're uh, extending the ability for them to use that space as a drive through this evening. So please, uh, Justin, if we did not give an extension, if they came back later on, they would have to go through the whole process all over again. Correct. Thank you. Are we, this is just education for me. Are we limited on like one extension or could we do this again in six months? If something happened you can do it again I mean, okay you can continue those extensions if you'd like and you don't have to do it for the 180 days either you okay. can grant it however you'd like the 180 days is the maximum okay okay well we'll leave a little space if there's any discussion or any more questions and if not then we'll look for a motion to extend the conditional use 
for, for 180 days or less if, if somebody sees that fit. Mr. Chairperson, I, Vance Gar, would move that you're authorized to sign a resolution granting a 180-day extension to the conditional use permit for BZA-CU-2021-01. Thank you, Vance. With the motion, do we have a second? I Gary, a second. Gary, motion. thank you. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carrying. Mr. Chairperson, I make a motion that we adjoin, adjourn the Board of Zoning Appeals and reconvene the Planning Commission. Thank you, Gary, for the motion. I will second the motion. Uh, do uh, all in favor say aye. aye? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. So we'll reconvene the Planning Commission with item number 5.2, the Andover Parks and Recreation Playbook, uh, staff, uh, or Daniel. I don't know who's carrying the ball on that. Good evening, thanks for having us here. Uh, I'd like to spend a few minutes, uh, go over the recently approved 2030 Parks and Recreation Playbook, which is our master plan for the next 10 year planning horizon. Uh, we've been working on this since late 2020. Uh, the city hired Landworks Studio to be our third party consultant to help Put all of these pieces together. The full plan's available. Uh, this is obviously a abbreviated version uh, to give you an overview and discuss some of the highlights. And if you have any questions along the way, feel free to ask and uh, hopefully we'll answer those. But if they come up, we can address them as we go. Uh, the master plan, when we worked with Landworks uh, right on the onset, it was clear that we needed a focus on the built environment, our amenities, capital project type approach. Also needed some effort put into organizational issues, uh, non-building type uh, initiatives. But the first phase they went into was a community survey, start to engage the community, see where we stood presently and what the community community was missing. Uh, and this happened in multiple venues or in mo multiple paths. They did a uh, household survey. Over 5,000 surveys went out to ha households in Andover. They got a response of uh, over 400, a little over 10%. They were looking for a response of around 300 to get to a 90 plus confidence interval and they got to over 400 so they got over 97. Uh, the second uh, heading up there is 720. They got um, a uh, open source, uh, it's not an open source, but they social pinpoint website where folks could go on under their own time and energy. They got over 700 unique uh, visits to that site to leave comments, both, both uh, positive and negative about the system inventory. Uh, so those combined with the staff uh, charrettes and and uh, meetings led to a lot of the information and direction that this plan gives. The plan's got nearly $20 million of recommendations. Uh, nearly 4 million of that is for capital and equipment. Over the 10 years, it recommends adding close to seven FTEs most of those would be full-time staff. A couple of those would be uh, part-time equivalents. It also includes potentially four additional uh, park properties and nearly five miles of multimodal trails to add to our existing network. And one highlight of the plan is the uh, specific attention that they gave to 13th Street Sports Park. There's a Proposal on the sales tax or uh, on the ballot this November for the sales tax uh, to to let the public have an opportunity to see if they would like to fund substantial redesign and redevelopment of that property. And that's a little over ten million dollars. This is a little highlight of the social pinpoint website. You can see the satellite imagery there of the. City of Andover, a lot of the areas that were marked by citizens. The word cloud there was one way they 
decided to present some of the popular topics that came up. Um, those included some of our popular programs, some of the amenities that we miss or don't have, like splash pads, uh, some uh, amenities they'd like to see more of, like trails and upgraded playgrounds. So you can see some of the stats there. They had over 700 unique users visit, over 100 comments, and close to 2,000 total visits to the site. So while this doesn't contribute to the statistical surveys that uh, drove some of the decisions, it, it in a way validated with some anecdotal evidence what uh, folks in the community are needing and wanting. A couple of the most important things that are derived from the community engagement process are where to invest uh, time and energies, resources. Um, there are two major areas where this was discussed. One was uh, facility investments and the other was with programs. This first bar chart here uh, show, highlights some of the priority investment ratings. That's a function of two uh, items. One is the desire of the citizens to participate in said activities or with said facilities. And then uh, that's combined with how our current inventories uh, in the community meet those needs. Uh, so you can think of things in the high priority as uh, of high interest, but low accessibility or maybe uh, underperforming facilities in those areas. So some of the top items are walking and biking trails, natural areas, natural parks, preserves, splash pads, general outdoor recreation, outdoor pools, and then indoor running and walking tracks. Obviously on the bar chart there on the right, you can see there's a, a very exhaustive list of of uh, facilities, many of which uh, the city has either in public or private inventory. <laughs> Similarly, this is the same concept, but aimed at the programs that the department offers or does not offer. And the, again, similarly derived, the top uh, investment priorities are adult, and fit, adult fitness and wellness programs, community special events, fishing, which was a broad category to include education and fishing derby type things for youth, exercise classes, outdoor environmental programs, golf lessons, open play leagues, and senior programs. And as a side, I guess a side note to this slide, I mean, some of these uh, uh, programs, the, the department and the city currently participate in, we've currently, it would be fair to say, have grown in the last several years. And obviously some of these programs we, we don't, we don't uh, participate with at this time. Landworks Studio worked with the staff uh, for several, several different meetings to start uh, you know, blending all of this information together, making it coherent how, and how to uh, work on a path forward. Um, you can see here uh, some of the slides from uh, some of our work we did, even in this room, uh, going over some of the focus and uh, again, condensing all that down into uh, useful findings. Also part of the master plan, there was a pretty thorough system inventory. This is literally one page of it. It, it goes property by property, which we uh, should probably summarize here at this meeting. But um, the two maps on the right focus on the service areas that various amenities in the city cover. And on the right-hand side, you've got a representation of the public facilities owned and operated by the city of Andover. Several large properties like the Municipal Golf Course, the Central Park where we are today, 13th Street. And they have a, a service radius of a couple miles. We have several smaller properties, neighborhood and sometimes called pocket parks uh, spread throughout several of the neighborhoods. And 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 as we all knew, you know, there, there was a little bit of a uh, lack of coverage of service to the southern part of the town, particularly south of Kellogg. And on the left-hand side there, those are uh, recreation or quality of life 
facilities not operated by the city. Some are private, some are uh, the YMCA, some are school uh, facilities, and others are uh, Teradyne and Flint Hills National private golf courses. One of the big things that came out of the inventory was that uh, some of our smaller properties are perhaps not, uh, they don't contain a lot of the amenities that might give them a very high rating. They weren't as connected as some of our larger properties were. Uh, definitely, as you're all aware, a lot of investment has been made at Central Park in the last decade. A lot of development, a lot of trail connectivity, amphitheater, new facilities, et cetera. Um, we also, it was very clear to them, it, it essentially confirmed things we already knew in-house, is that we have pretty limited space for programming. We lean on the school district for a lot of our program facilities, both indoor and outdoor. And uh, it was pretty much drawn the conclusion that 13th Street Sports Park was the property or is the property that could potentially start meeting more of those needs in the immediate future. So after the community engagement, the staff engagement, the system inventories, kind of re review of the last six years of our operating uh, procedures, uh, they started to develop a strategic action plan. And this is, again, many pages. There, there are two pages here for examples. And uh, the strategic action plan uh, is broken into three phases. First phase being uh, items or initiatives that are hoped to be executed in the first two to four years of the 10 year plan. Uh, phase two would be the middle section and, and phase three would be the last three or four years of the of the 10 year plan. Here on this slide, you see there's a, a selection of priority one items. Uh, those include a variety of, of things uh, from trails to developments or improvements at 13th Park, a couple of uh, projects at small neighborhood parks. They've assigned a uh, one of five different goals that those would tie to between uh, sustainability, wellness, authenticity, et cetera. Uh, they've also assigned a, a, a rough budget to those items, a potential source of where those could be paid from, and a rough estimate of how long it would take to execute that particular project. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, the master plan is not purely about the built environment and includes uh, quite a bit of recommendations for organizational, operational type items. Uh, the second slide here highlights a few of those. Uh, oops, I didn't, slip. There, there we are. We've got uh, some items like developing a program catalog, working on our digital presence or social media strategy, departmental website, items like that, uh, an official program proposal method. So these are things that obviously aren't going to cost in the sense of a traditional budget, but definitely some staff time, effort, and planning. Some of the other key findings that are highlighted in the strategic action plan uh, is it, it, it confirms the fact that uh, the department has grown in the last five, six, seven years, uh, its responsibilities, its capital projects that have been in, uh, implemented in its inventory have, have grown. The uh, one, one of the other items to note is that many of the recommendations at this time uh, do not have a funding source. Uh, we, we have approximately $275,000 a year to spend on annual capital projects. The plan uh, includes more than that. Uh, there will need to be additional sources of revenue to meet all of these demands that the community is uh, identifying as important. One other point of uh, highlight would be that uh, the department has currently around a 40% cost recovery rate when all forms of revenue are taken into account. 
Um, the department obviously raises fees through user fees for leagues, programs, and activities. The department also has funds that uh, channel monies from fireworks licensing, uh, cell phone tower rentals, liquor tax, et cetera. Um, even some fees that are derived from new building permits. So while those aren't exactly uh, fees derived from individual users willing to pay to participate in certain activities, they are, they are in a sense offsetting some of the responsibility the general fund has to contribute to the, to the budget. Some reasonable amount of time was also spent on addressing our current organizational structure. And one of the, one or two of the major items that was discussed more than once was the fact that community events uh, are managed in a, in a divided manner currently uh, across several chains of command. Uh, and it, and, and community events are pretty integral in the parks and recreation arena and, and effort. And as you saw in the, the data and the, the uh, surveys earlier in the presentation there, community events are in the top two of all items the citizens are reporting as important to them. So you'll see a picture there of our current structure. Uh, Parks and Recreation operates as a, as a department or division under Public Works. And our events director operates somewhat uh, on the side of that, although we do work together uh, pretty regularly. Uh, formally, the department, they're, they're not a part of the department. Uh, so on the next slide, you can see some recommendations that how the department may look in a few years, short term to long term. Um, you know, there are a lot of models for how parks and recreation departments are managed in communities. There are the, the parks and rec commission models. There are full-blown parks and recreation departments. I'm much more familiar with the latter uh, in my professional experience, but both have their place and both uh, work for various communities. Uh, this proposal here is, is envisioning what, um, what might best suit the inventory programs and event responsibilities over the next few years. Uh, so essentially we already have a parks assistant manager and a recreation assistant manager currently. Our events director could theoretically move in to the department in that similar type of capacity with similar responsibility. And then if uh, the 13th Street Park plan is approved and funded, uh, there would need to be some kind of an assistant manager or manager uh, for the indoor facility. Here's a quick summary. It's a terrible PowerPoint slide because it's all text, but uh, it's a quick summary of some of the capital and equipment projects that you will find recommended in the plan some highlighted items here, close to a million dollars worth at Central Park, uh, upgrading facilities around the, uh, around the lake, around the docks, uh, are replacing some of the becoming dated playground structures, working on more picnic shelter and uh, amenities in the southern part of the, of the property, uh, and either updating or removing some of the old camp structures. There's also projects called out for Cornerstone Neighborhood Park there, additional trails, signage, and restroom. Some projects there for the couple of the mini parks, the golf course, and the Redbud Trailhead. Many of these projects are, are on the departmental radar in a sense. Uh, some have been worked on or are beginning to be worked on, uh, and some even have the potential for um, grant contributions to help offset some of these costs, uh, such as the docks at Lake George, the restroom at the Real Redbud Trailhead. We've worked with the state on some uh, grant funding for that. The, 
The plan also calls out, as we mentioned earlier, close to five additional miles of multimodal trail to help make key connections between existing uh, trails in and along arterial roads in the in the city. Uh, you know, as you are aware, you've heard Les present lots of these in the past. This would be a continuation of many of those. Uh, and there are key several key connections there uh, mentioned in that list. And they're highlighted in orange on the map. It's kind of hard for me to see the color there, but it looks better on the computer. Yeah, it looks a lot better on the computer. Clearly there, there are significant maintenance responsibilities that the department has currently and would, those would obviously increase with increase in properties increase in complexity of the facilities on those properties, increase, increase in the trail network, et cetera. Um, so just under a million dollars, again, over 10 years to make key replacements to some of the mid duty and heavy equipment, uh, tractors, grounds, equipment, et cetera. Uh, everything on that list there that you see are items that the department already owns. This would be a, essentially a timely turnover of equipment as those aged out. And it would, it's probably worth noting that uh, the city's in, uh, currently engaging in a, an equity lease model for our pickup fleet uh, and passenger vehicle fleet across the city. So some of those items uh, will be taken care of sooner rather than later. Uh, but again, most of those are grounds equipment and specialty pieces of equipment that will not be in the equity lease program with enterprise. One of the final major components of the 10 year master plan included a, a special section just for 13th street sports park. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with that facility, uh, that property. Uh, it served the community well over many years. Uh, the summary is though, our, as, the, as the community has grown, the programs have grown, uh, we have simply outgrown many of the amenities on the property uh, or they've begun to reach the end of their service life. Landworks divided this project up into kind of three phases to help plan and digest the concepts, um, first phase being addressing the ball fields at the very north end of the park. You're probably familiar that we have four diamonds right now, three of which are lighted. It allows us to play about 35 to 37 ball games per week during our youth ball season. Under this proposal, we would go to five fields, all five would be lit, and we could move to a model where we could fit around 60 to 65 games per week. The last couple of seasons, we've had to cap uh, enrollment in the baseball and softball program, simply because uh, even with our facilities and utilizing some of the school district facilities, we're out of space and we cannot meet uh, all of the games in the required time that the league requires. So this would give us uh, a 30%, 25, 30% increase in the number of games we could play. As you're probably familiar with, several of the fields that are currently there have significant drainage issues. Uh, if we could relocate these, sit, set them in a wagon wheel or a cloverleaf for, formation, properly crown them and all of that, we, we could dramatically reduce the number of games that we have to cancel for kids every year or every season. In the phase two deals with the center part of the park and uh, adds several destination play features that are missing or we don't have in our inventory, including a nice splash pad, large destination playground, some multi multi-purpose outdoor courts for pickleball, racket sports, and so forth. And then a, a great lawn that would be a multi-purpose space uh, for a variety of team sports, community gatherings, facility rentals, that sort of thing. Phase three, it would involve the property in the south, the portion of the property in the southeast uh, part of the parcel. 
proposed to have a new community center building to replace the ACC that we have now. Uh, it'd be a, a larger facility with full size uh, sport courts indoors to allow the department to play volleyball and basketball uh, on city properties uh, and, and reduce the demands we place on the school district for facilities. The other major concept of the property that also aligns very well with some of the strategic action plan and the, and the priority initiatives is to work on the Western portion of the property and utilizing the lower floodplain areas for natural spaces, trails, uh, and, and uh, connect those to Redbud Trail. That concept uh, of moving the developed features and hugging the eastern half of the property out of the floodway and enhancing the floodway with native plantings, trails, and, and, and uh, forested spaces, et cetera, really is a kind of a best of both worlds in meeting some of those top uh, items that the community is looking for in our spaces. Landworks did a brief, uh, more detailed look or proposal into what a, um, a more developed community center building might be able to produce. Obviously the facility right now is on demand only unless it's a, uh, a departmental program like pickleball or, or dance or, or so forth. Um, this envisions a facility that is more open during the business hours and into the evening it would be available for potentially drop-in use over the lunch hours and things like that. I uh, would have multiple rentable uh, meeting spaces in the facility, uh, potentially an elevated running and walking track. Um, obviously the very, the, the fine details of such facility will be uh, hammered out in the, as needed in the next phases of the plan. But that was some of the rough concepts and they made some assumptions on what, a facility operating in that manner might cost to operate as far as staffing and what it might potentially uh, reap as far as re revenue uh, with rentals, program fees, and so forth. So it's a big plan. There's over 100 pages. That was a real brief summary. Uh, I hope it made a little bit of sense uh, between the community engagement and outreach. Uh, working with the, with the city staff and then blending all of those pieces of information into a, a format that gives us a roadmap for the next 10 years, both uh, in, the, in the built park space and in the organizational space on, on what we need to do moving forward. But I'm, feel free to ask any questions if you have, and I try to answer them. Lance was a big part of the process as well. And as you know, Les has been involved with the parks in the department for many years too. So we could probably manage between us to answer any. Yeah, you took a big topic and did a nice job of succinctly explaining it. Appreciate it. Any questions for Daniel or thoughts? Were you surprised by the survey results or was pretty much what you thought? I think it was a little bit of both. Um, there was definitely a little bit less emphasis on uh, some of the team sports types uh, spaces and activities. And uh, I personally would have ranked natural spaces and trails pretty high, but to see the broader community really rank those among the top two or three or even number one on a couple of cases, uh, depending on the data you're looking at. Uh, but that speaks to some of the good money and work that you all have spent on the multimodal network around town and, as uh, Brian Sturm was one of the leads for Landworks mentioned that most communities our size do not have the, the inventory of trails that we do. Uh, that's been a, a real amenity. I think uh, some of the other recommendations with program procedures, kind of industry best practices uh, make a lot of sense if you're familiar with those, in other cities and other departments, how they operate, uh, things like cost recovery, 
uh, goals, uh, program proposal strategies, how the staff would be organized. Those all all make a lot of good sense. And and honestly, some have some of those things were have been discussions in and around the department that predate this plan anyway. So um, I don't know that I had any other big things that I saw as a, a surprise in a sense, but sometimes the best thing that these plans help provide is just sifting through everything and coming to a coherent, you know, batch of information that you could do something with uh, a lot of, a lot of work and time from ETC Institute went into the statistical information and the survey questions. They, they do that nationwide across communities all over. So it, can, it was good I, to see. I the, can picture North and South of 13th street park. I'm having a hard time picturing East and West. The things that are up on the ballot and everything is, is 13th street park going to have the same footprint just a lot differently or is there a bigger footprint? Correct. The, so the, in the slide still on the screen, that outer property boundary is exactly the same as it is today. What is that last 52 or four acres? It's an 80 with the turnpike coming through it. Uh, the typical quarter mile by half mile. But property. with that additional corner to the west east that was purchased by the city where the carnival ride. Correct. Yeah, sure. Right. Where that yeah, that's, that, that's where the new facility is going, right? The right. New, that's that's shown there, uh, just right. east of Patricia Lane and south of the Redbud Trail and north of 13th Park. Uh, the city's been working on cleaning that particular parcel up. Uh, a lot of that has uh, materials have been removed. Uh, it's not quite ready for obviously the next phase, but it is in city possession now. Daniel, do you, do you still continue to receive input from citizens on this proposal? You know, I can ride my bike through the park and I see all the boards that are up, you know, explaining what's going on. Are people commenting on those? So this, the particular master plan commenting period and, and engagement is over. However, I mean, the, the fact uh, that the initiative is on the ballot in November is still we do answer and field questions about that uh, obviously it it needs to go to the citizens as to whether they would like to fund uh, these amenities in that manner uh, that's up to them to decide it's it's too large of a project to chip away at with typical annual budgets you know a few yeah. thousand dollars here and there um, and there will be uh, if the sales tax does pass there will be other engagement periods uh, when we deal with you know final details of these phases particularly the community center uh, feasibility study is is recommended for that particular part to make sure the city uh, spends money and and builds something on that uh, a facility that will be used uh, that can be uh, we can afford etc so there was there are definitely is more opportunities in the future uh, but the master plan portion it is is over. Okay. The only reason I ask is, you know, I was out at the parade for Greater Andover Days, and several people commented to me on, you know, the vote for the park and the fire station improvements and the new fire station. And a couple of them said, don't want the parks, want the fire station. You know, they see the need for the fire department. What happens if that vote doesn't pass? I mean, do you feel good about it right now? Hard to say. As I can tell you, anecdotally speaking and historically speaking, the city of Andover and its citizens have largely supported sales tax initiatives to fund large projects like this. That's about as confident as I would be willing to state because you, you just never know. He, he, I mean, it's just there are so many different variables that factor into successful sales tax initiatives. So uh, um, I can tell you, again, anecdotally speaking, is uh, we've heard some of that sentiment from some um, and inversely for others, you know, depending on the two projects. So you, we'll see is kind of the, the moral of that story. But uh, um, 
And you had another question. Oh, your question. They are tied together. So a no vote is a no for both. A yes is a yes for both. There is no a la carte option on this question. Gary, if uh, if it is a, a no vote, obviously serious, significant portions of that the plan that you see above would have to be reevaluated. Uh, there are. It is important to remember, though, that the master the ten year master plan is not purely about thirteenth part. Yeah, uh, it, it's uh, still addresses issues in trails, uh, neighborhood properties, Central Park, and organizational issues and structures and initiatives and things so uh, but 13th would have to uh, continue as is for some time daniel thank you you're welcome appreciate it yeah thank you very much um mr chairperson just to kind of tie a bow on that and give justin a little bit of a segue he's probably going to segue this way anyway so i'm gonna steal his thunder Sounds well good. one reason outside it's just kind of general awareness for you all and what's in that plan is uh when Les and justin are producing these staff reports and recommendations whether it's a subdivision case or a, a zoning case or a whatever, all the stuff that you all make decisions on and these gentlemen make recommendations on, they're using these long range planning studies and documents to, to, to guide their recommendations and advice that they provide to you. So their charge, even though this is a public works and utilities document is to understand this document and reflect the principles and priorities that the community wants. And that's memorialized into this plan into the recommendations to you. So when you talk about land use, you know, where it's talking about increasing density and the impact it has on services like parks um, and trail usage or where we put parks or, you know, that whole capital kind of conversation that you guys see uh, very regularly at your meetings. So that's one reason why we wanted to make sure that you guys had the time with Daniel to kind of understand it from his perspective and kind of task you all with keeping it in the back of your minds as well as you're making decisions that you're tasked to make. So obviously, thank you. That's a nice forms, a nice overlay of, you know, as we're thinking through things. So, so this is like, like I said, one of the long range planning documents that these gentlemen will use. Uh, the other one is the comprehensive plan, which Justin will introduce for you when you're ready. When no, you're ready. I think we're ready. Well done. All right. Well, thanks for teaming me up, Lance. Uh, so the comprehensive plan, um, obviously Daniel mentioned the master parks plan. We're at the tail end of that. We are just now starting the comprehensive plan process, which as Lance alluded to is what I would like to say is the long range plan. The comprehensive plan being essentially, uh, what land use in the city will be. Uh, it in includes the general location characteristics the extent of the relationship of our future land uses. So it's, it, it is a plan that, that as uh, planners, we consult regularly when it comes to our more immediate plans. So we will look at the comprehensive plan when we are looking at a standard zoning case, or we will uh, review the comprehensive plan when we are looking at a subdivision or pretty much any of the daily applications uh, agenda items that we receive, we're typically reviewing on the comprehensive plan. So again, it promotes the desired pattern and character of growth within the city. Um, again, land use subdivision, public infrastructure decisions. Uh, we are a growing community and a uh, fast growing community that the uh, public infrastructure certainly plays into uh, how we will develop in, in the coming years. Our current comprehensive plan is a 10 year plan. Uh, it was developed in 2014 and it runs through December, 2023. This new 10 year planning horizon will go until 2033. Uh, so we typically like to see 10 year planning horizons because anything greater, you're starting to get into a territory where, you know, things change so fast and 10 years seems to be the, the appropriate timeline there. Um, your role as the planning commission is actually pretty important through the process because you will be with us every step of the way staff 
uh, similar to the uh, Parks Master Plan, we will work with a consultant and you will be informed throughout that process. You will be involved in that process and ultimately you will adopt the comprehensive plan. Uh, that comprehensive plan will be ultimately approved by the governing body, but you will have a pretty significant role as we move forward. Uh, that map that you see on the right-hand side of the screen, that is our uh, city limits. The area in, in, in orange, that is, our, that is our planning area. The border around that, uh, on the west side, we have 159th Street, uh, half mile south of uh, 130th, and Indianola to the east and 60th Street up north. That is our planning area. So the planning area is... Uh, everything that is encompassed within the comprehensive plan so that that does go beyond the the city limits uh, a couple of the big contents that we would uh, like to see addressed within this comprehensive plan obviously i mentioned land use that's the big one uh, kind of the roadmap to where we're going in the future um, development patterns place making characteristics streetscaping improvements uh, how do we want our built environment to look? How do we want the city to develop over the course of the next 10 years? And as we receive those applications, those zoning applications, those subdivision applications, we will go to that comprehensive plan and say, hey, does this match up with what we wanted? Uh, quality of life amenities will be included in there. You saw Daniel address some of those items in the parks master plan. Quality of life amenities, including parks, trails, a lot of those elements that were included in that parks master plan will be addressed as part of this overall comprehensive plan. As I mentioned before, infrastructure, a large component when it comes to the development of the city, subdivisions, um, subdivision expansion and growth, proposed improvements to meet the city's growing population. I mentioned previously our population increased from 2010 to 2020, increased 26%. So we're going to have to build for that and, and take that into account as we grow into the future. Uh, housing choices, diversity. Obviously, the city of Andover has a lot of single family residences, but uh, we're growing and, and those needs change. Uh, apartment buildings, uh, two family homes. Obviously, with the heritage, we're seeing more mixed uses. Will we need to see more of that in the future? What, what do we need to see to meet our growing demographics? Uh, obviously, we have a lot of people who commute from uh, the city of Wichita, that work in the city of Wichita and live in the city of Andover. And, and you know, will that change? Vice versa, will, what will those housing needs be? How will those demographic trends and characteristics change in our city within the next 10 years? Uh, from a more technical standpoint, the comprehensive plan will include a future land use map. That is something that staff consults on a regular basis. Obviously, you've all seen the zoning map. It's color coded. It has all of our zoning district classifications on there. The future land use map, which is something that staff consults on a regular basis, is a bit more blobby. It's a bit different looking. It's a bit more uh, grand in scale, but not as specific as a zoning map. So instead of a specific zoning district where there's multiple single family uses, a comprehensive map might just have a big yellow blob on it that says a residential. But it's something that we consult because it gives you a bigger picture of how the city is going to look in the future and how we kind of want the layout of our city to look. Um, one thing that will be a part of that is obviously updating that map for where we are and where we want to go, but we are also going to be requesting a street classification map. That is something that we currently do now where we determine whether or not a street is an arterial, a collector, a local street, but this, and it's based on definitions within our unified development manual. Obviously we would like to see a map that specifically designates what those streets are. Um, and then finally, delivering the plan, there's going to be a significant implementation component to how the plan will look once we receive it and how we're actually going to deliver the goods, things that we would like to see in the future, those community desires, those community needs. How will we go forward with the knowledge that we get from the consultant in this plan? Obviously, public participation is going to be a huge component to this. I mentioned your roles as planning commissioners. 
uh, the consultant will want to hear from as many people as possible. That includes both residents, obviously, non-residents, people that work in the city, people that study at Butler Community College, uh, our business community, um, the development community, people that we deal with on a regular basis. All of these individuals have a say and, and, and a vision and opinions on how they think the city will develop in, in the coming years. And we want to hear from as many of them as we can. So there will be workshops available for the general public. Obviously, you'll all be invited to those. Um, we would like to spread those out as much as possible. The current RFP that we are releasing for the consultants calls for at least three of those workshops tried to be spread out over the course of the, that whole period where we can get some night meetings, some day meetings to try and get as much input as we can from the public. Um, obviously, the consultant will be meeting with you directly and they will be meeting with the governing body directly as well. Once we do uh, release the RFP, which will be uh, quite soon, uh, the proposals that we receive from the consultants will be evaluated by a seven-person committee consisting of two planning commissioners, two city council members, and three city staff members. Uh, that seven-member committee, if you are interested in serving on that committee, uh, you're more than welcome to let staff know anytime an email works after this meeting works. Um, ultimately, that seven member staff will, uh, excuse me, seven member committee will be approved by Mayor Ronnie Price. So uh, he has ultimate say there, but um, obviously we're open to suggestions. So if you're interested in serving as one of the two members on the selection committee to select that consultant, please let us know. Um, Basically, the, the criteria there, I've included that. It will, uh, we, we are encouraging uh, consultants to be as imaginative as possible. We are looking at their project approach, uh, their content, their timeline. Obviously, we'll be looking at qualifications, how often they've done this, have they done this before, uh, how many times they've done comprehensive plans, especially in cities with a similar demographic as the city of Andover. We are looking for uh, that growing city and, and, and the consultant that actually has experience working with cities similar to us. Um, and then, of course, project fee structure and cost estimate is a portion of that. But um, we are certainly looking for the best qualified consultant there. Overall timeline. Obviously, this evening, October 19th, we wanted to give you an update on this process give you a feel for what the comprehensive plan is, how staff uses it, and give you a chance to sort of look at the RFP and its contents to see, hey, this should be added, or we have the suggestion, or we would like to see this going forward. Um, we do plan to distribute and advertise for the RFP in the coming week or so with a submittal deadline of early December, followed by... Uh, um, a selection committee, that selection committee that I mentioned, that seven member com committee, we will hopefully get together mid-December to discuss those submittals. And then finally, uh, early January, first quarter of January, we will be um, uh, reaching out to that consultant, getting that agreement settled and moving forward in the first quarter of 2022 with that outreach process. Uh, so, very exciting overall. We're, we're, we're very excited to see it. Very similar to the master parks plan that that uh, that Daniel mentioned. Obviously, maybe a, a bit larger in scale where it doesn't just focus on parks. We're focusing on the entire community. So, uh, like I said, very exciting times and uh, happy to hear any feedback or questions. Is the consultant that did the one 10 years ago still in business? And do you think they'll hop in the game? I believe they are in business and I would hope that they would hop in the game. We're hoping to get as many responses as possible. So we, we were happy with whatever they did 10 years ago. If they hopped in the game, we'd be all right. Okay. And less with your history, how close are we in that 10 year past 10 year plan in actually realizing and seeing all that fulfilled? 
were they pretty accurate? Andover has a long history of adopting plans and then achieving all the goals in that plan, most of the time before the, the terminus of that plan. So Daniel's park plan, there were very few of those items that are included in this newest plan that were carried over from the last plan because he's already worked through those. Uh, projections, growth, utilities, roads are very close to what the prior plan projected. The US 54 corridor study seemed to be a bit of a dream when it was adopted back in 2011. It's a reality today. Mm -hmm. So we have a long history of, of setting a goal and achieving that goal through a plan. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. It's cool to hear. Yeah. No, I, I was struck by what seemed like a relatively quick turnaround time from the RS, RFP being published and submittals back. But in that world, that must be standard. Yeah, I think it's pretty standard. Um, uh, the timeline is pretty accurate. Uh, I would say it's maybe a little rough. We might tinker with it just a little bit, but we wanted to give you a general idea this evening of how that would play out. Thank you, my friend. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Justin. I forget how far out the ETJ goes. I, yeah. I don't see that map very often. I'm sure it's probably in the last comprehensive planning or somewhere on the website, but I kind of forget that it goes even north of 60th all the way up to that creek okay. that runs through there, whatever it's called. It really hasn't changed much in yeah. over 30 years. Sure. And I forget it goes that far east, too, all the way to Indianola. Yeah, I forgot that too. So I've read that. I so it's like well. 35 square miles or something. Is that what I read? 30, 32. I think it's four eight, by eight. eight times four, yeah. about 32. Well, that's neat. Yeah, 32 right there. So we could basically triple the size of Andover. Down the line, we could. You just have to recruit everyone to come live here. Gary, is all you have to do. All right, let's uh, bring it home with item 5.4, Family Future Forward Sales Tax Update. Uh, whoever's carrying the ball on that one, please. I drew the short stick, so you get me. All so, right, bye -bye. Uh, With me tonight, though, is Assistant Chief of Andover Fire Rescue, Andy Seville. So I'll handle a little bit of the presentation stuff, but if you guys have uh, nuanced or detailed questions regarding any of the proposed projects to, to support Andover Fire Rescue, um, the assistant chief can definitely help me with those. So I'm hopeful tonight isn't the first time that you've heard that a sales tax question will be on the November 2nd ballot. Um, with that being my assumption, I'm not going to spend 20 minutes detailing everything that's within that tax. I'll hit somewhere within that question, um, but I'll hit some of the high points. And then really, we wanted to give you all an opportunity as being some of our most vested and interested citizens um, to ask questions of us that uh, you then in turn can represent to those questions in the community if you if you're so faced with those so uh, generally, the sales tax uh, question that will show up on most of your ballots, Vance, I don't think you get to vote on this one being outside the city limits. So just a cheerleader from the corner, right? That's right. So, uh, uh, But uh, the question will be to support some improvements to uh, the fire life safety operations within the city, uh, primarily the construction of a second fire station uh, south of Kellogg. So that'll be at the property that the city has fairly recently purchased at the corner of Minaha and Andover Road, directly south of the Goodyear, the fire, uh, Kansas land, yeah. whatever it yeah. is. Yeah. All right. So if you drive by now, you'll see one of those signs out that says future home of Andover Fire Rescue Station 2, vote November 2nd. So that is a primary project, uh, one of the primary projects. 
Also, for Andover Fire Rescue, it will include the remodel of the current fire station. I don't know if any of you happen to uh, have time to go to the open house that uh, was a couple weeks ago. Um, but they, they have you know, substantially outgrown that facility to the point where literally fire are, you know, our first responders are, we have converted closets to sleeping space. Um, we currently are running out of space, generally living space, equipment space. So it'll include a remodel of that to hopefully make it to extend its life into the future. Um, additionally, and kind of bridging both the worlds of emergency response improvements and parks and recreation improvements is that site of the second fire station at Minahan Andover Road will also include a park amenity. So you'll have the fire station and then what we have conceptually depicted now is a splash pad, again, echoing some of those sentiments that we heard through the Andover uh, Parks and Recreation Playbook. So that's uh, kind of that first bucket of projects, if you will. Those total about $6.75 million in terms of investment. And then the remaining ten and a quarter million dollars um, is uh, dedicated to those improvements that Daniel went over for 13th Street Sports Park. Um, so obviously we're getting a, and I should back up and say to get you know that a lot of those improvements that we detailed for Andover Fire Rescue, they themselves went through a fairly extensive extensive planning process, very similar to what you know Daniel has done in parks and what Justin and Les are getting ready to do from the comprehensive plan. In 2017, they had a comprehensive analysis of the services they provide, and then obviously with our tremendous growth. Very good thing, um, but it stresses the services that we provide, whether they're parks and recreation or whether they're emergency response. So how do we put ourselves in a position over the next 10, 15, 20 years to handle that, be ahead of the curve so we don't see a level of service experience of our citizens and visitors that's uh, not to the standards of which is expected now? So a result of that 2017 comprehensive analysis that they've done, uh, these are recommendations or implementation strategies that were set forth in that. So these projects that we're proposing total $17 million, a very uh, significant investment into, into our community, but not something that uh, we haven't been carefully analyzing for the last say like five years at this point, waiting to get to the point to where we had enough information and data and community engagement to really make an informed decision on how we wanted to package that and bring it to the citizens. So that those projects are what will be funded or are proposed to be funded. They total $17 million. So backing into that number, we came up with a one cent temporary sales tax. Um, for that will last no longer than eight years. It has to go away in eight years. So we've, we generate, um, we used about $2.35 million a year for our, our projection that would be generated, which is conservative for you know reference. This year we're on pace to, to collect about 2.7 million in sales tax. So what that means is that uh, if we continue that pace and hopefully we continue to collect more sales tax as we continue to grow, especially with the projects such as the heritage that are coming online should open up some retail opportunities that a future governing body will have a decision to make. They can sunset this sales tax early. So let's say the projects come in at 17 million um, and we have, we've collected that 17 million in six years. Then that governing body that's seated at that point will have the de decision, uh, the authority to end the sales tax right then. So they can end it early at any point. Um, the only thing I can tell you for sure with 100% certainty is it can't go past eight years. So that's kind of how we've came up with the one cent for eight years to give a little flexibility for that future governing body. At such time, let's say in six years, We've collected enough to pay for those projects. That governing body would also have that uh, the authority, the ability to use that sales tax revenue for other parks and recreation improvements that are envisioned within that uh, in, in, within the playbook, or to equip the fire station. If we, you know, instead of using property tax 
to, to fund a new ladder truck or uh, whatever equipment that they need, those big purchases, they could also do that. But it's very specifically narrowed to those two operational categories, if you will, of the city. So I, with that, I think I'll stop and provide you guys some space to ask some questions, if you have any. Well, um, Chief, I'll just call it Chief. Instead Andy of is fine. Yeah. Um, and I, I saw in there that right now you're trying to get to a four-minute response time anywhere in the city of Andover within the city limits. And uh, I can imagine that sometimes having to cross 400 really delays that. So there is a need, and you would be able to also come north of 400. Um, what is your current time? Is it over four minutes? Is it? So, yeah, yeah. four minutes is our goal within the city limits um, to, to achieve that 90% of the time. Okay. Um, for example, the neighborhood um, Reflection Lakes to the south of Dillon's and all that there, for example, we make that four-minute um, response time. I think 50 or 55% of the time. So you're right, the Kellogg 54 corridor, I mean, it, it is um, not only, you know, slow to get through there sometimes, it's also dangerous. So yeah, we're, we're, we're not achieving our goal south of Kellogg, you know, at least half the time. And the further south you get, of course, the longer our response time gets, so. And uh, are you ever called to assist in other communities because of, fires or anything let's say would you ever be called down to rose hill because their fire department can't handle the Fre situation frequently we we go to rose hill um benton um we go west to cedric county a couple miles and we'll go over to augusta every so often as well but but um rose hill and in in benton more so than east and west and they reciprocate they come back the other direction sure um we, we all work together. Uh, we all, we have automatic and mutual aid agreements uh, for that purpose. So, because um, neither one of us have enough manpower or, or equipment to handle a, a structure fire, uh, for example, or a large grass fire. So yeah, we, we do go to Rose Hill and they come back about an equal amount of times each year. So I was in, I was out of town when the open house was held, but I had been in the fire station years ago, and it was crowded years ago. So I can see that there's a real need to alleviate all the problems that are in that building. Yeah, it's it's pretty tight, and and you know, we, firefighters are are generally a pretty tight knit group, but uh, not that tight. Yeah, and, two guys uh, sleeping on a twin bed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you know, and um. When, when COVID came around and we you know, we were um, dealing with staffing shortages and, and trying to keep the crew separated so we continue to respond to these calls, I mean, we uh, we had to separate people as much as we can, but, you know, the rooms just aren't very big, so. Yeah, um, and I, I saw your number of calls has gone up to, I can't remember the number, a thousand or something. Yeah, we're over 1,400 now. Uh, when the station was built, we're, we were down about 200. So seven um, so, times. Yeah. Wow. And we, we did a pretty substantial change to our response um, mode here a couple of years ago. Um, we don't respond to lower acuity medical calls. Uh, we call them alpha and bravo level calls. Um, assuming the ambulance is here in town, they're not on a call. We don't respond to those. So if, if we hadn't have made that change, uh, we'd be at sixteen or 1,700 right now. So... Um, yeah. Thank you. Has the response from the community on the sales tax and the vote been quite positive yeah. regarding your project? Every, everything we've heard um, has been very positive. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've had some comments out in the public as well. We've we've had uh, several groups of people through our open house, and, and it was kind of eye opening, I think, for several people um, to see the the tight quarters. So yeah, it's, it's been a good response. And um, like, I think somebody may have mentioned earlier, everybody, you know, generally people are always for public safety. So yeah. Um. 
I, I, oh, no, I have a question, Lance, before we wrap up. Um, you said earlier when you kind of led into this, you said, I assume you guys have heard about this, on this, the ballot, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously, we had, is the table's general feeling that the word is getting out appropriately? Most people know about it, or, or do you think you think it something can be done? I sure hope so. I mean, okay. but we'll take any of any assistance we can in the education portion of that. Uh, we had a fairly extensive communications plan, you know, set forward. So I don't know uh, if I'm hoping you guys all got uh, a postcard in the mail. Yeah. Uh, if you didn't, then the post office, I'll call them, yeah. bring it up with them. I was but, just curious what you, yeah. if your, if your gut told you, yeah, the word's getting out pretty yeah, well. Yeah, no, I hope so. I mean, we've done, we've done obviously the postcard. We were at GAD this weekend with some information. We've got the website. Uh, we're on channel seven. I know you guys watch Cox channel seven all of the time. So you probably saw everything on there. Um, we've had the videos. If you haven't seen the videos that are on the website, uh, I would encourage you to do so. We, we've where it's got some 3d renderings of all the improvements can kind of overlaid on the existing and educational in nature we've got them uh we had them playing at the amphitheater screens i don't know if they still are they are we've been presenting at uh, homeowners associations we've presented in front of um, all the civic groups that we can think of within the city um so i think we've gotten the word out there um but you guys will probably know better than we do. We're kind of insulated, so. I, I mean, I've, I've heard about it multiple times, so I. Well, good. I I, and I just didn't know if I was paying more attention because of this role yeah. or if I've just been exposed to it a lot. So, I, I but no, it's it's been on my radar and banged on my head several times at just different events, so. Well, good. So that's why. So I should turn the question around. Like you guys are asking us how, what kind of feedback we've been getting. I know Gary, you had mentioned some uh, some of what you've heard at the parade. Yeah, I don't it, know a if couple anyone of else people has heard I, anything else. I have to else. say that uh, generally, it's the older population that is not in favor of the parks. You know, because they're not getting out and doing stuff. They're staying at home. That's right. But uh, anybody who's got younger kids, I mean, I come over here and the playground here at the park is always jammed. Yeah. You know, I'm out on Redbud Trail a lot and it's jammed with people. So I do have my little reminder. One of the cell, there was a sales tax for this facility, correct? For the city hall. For the city hall. It was what was expected yeah no as uh, as our community has a pretty demonstrated level of interest and acceptance of sales tax primarily as a alternative to property tax there's a reason why the city of andover's property tax is the second lowest in the metro area the only one that's lower than ours is wichita from a city perspective obviously what you guys pay is city community college county school district all of those things but there's a reason why ours has been able to remain as low as it is from a city perspective is because we've been able to fund some of those large investments through other means than property tax and this is no different than that but we also have a very demonstrated ex history of sunsetting sales tax early i think the citizens need to know that yeah, no, I think we've, uh, I, I, I don't, I think we, I mean, we've communicated that the possibility is there, but it's just always hard. It's hard. From messaging I perspectives. Mean, you know, we're talking about expansion of the city and all the things. Look what COVID did. You know, we're into the second year of that now. And it's just changed how things are done, how businesses run, you know, what people are doing, you know. People are, were home for a long time and were really out. You couldn't buy a bicycle anywhere because people were out riding bikes. Yeah, yeah. that kind of stuff because they were tired of being at home. You know, is that going to continue? Have people started to change their frame of mind of what they find is important in their lives? You know, 13th Street Park has pretty much been the same since... Oh man! When did we hold Gab there? When they were build uh, widening Andover Road, and we had to move it out there. And there was this: oh, we can't have Gad out there. Nobody's going to go. And it was one of the most successful years we ever had. 
and now it's here at the park. And I wanted to thank Daniel for the great work that the parks department did. I mean, what was, what do you think your, the response to GAD was this year? Was it up, down, equal? Most activities were really well attended. We had all of our traditional activities from Kids Fest to uh, Carnival. But we had six new, brand new additional activities this year, three different competitive sport activities from the golf tournament to disc golf and so forth to additional kids activities up here at the Central Park facilities around City Hall and Library. The library did all of their uh, you know, traditional activities as well. I, I think it was pretty well attended. The concert was as big of a normal, uh, a big of a concert as we typically have for the evening in GAD, two, two different performers. I think it went pretty well. Um, we had great weather too for four days, which mm -hmm. helped. Oh, it was <laughs> sure beautiful. Did. The only thing that I saw that I personally saw that was down would be tailgating. And that's because it's on the same night as the football games. Yeah, we did stream the, the Andover, Andover High game. Uh, the car show was as big as we'd ever had. I think there were over 60 entrants there as well. Yeah. But wanting people want those kinds of activities. We, I didn't, I'm sorry, Gary, you done? Oh, I know this is not a, was not a city event, but we went to the New Spring concert just out here and there were several thousand people there. I mean, how neat was that? How many people had not been here before? I mean, new, people go to New Spring from, I mean, people drive from an hour, east, west, north, south to go to New Spring and never been to the end of a park before. So if we can have this available to be used for something like that, you couldn't hardly find somewhere to sit. The food trucks, is anybody else there that night? The, they had four or five food trucks there, and the line from the parking lot on the, well, you know, the food trucks would have to be parked in the parking lot, were all the way up to the sidewalk in front of the amphitheater, or whatever you call it, the theater, and it was that way all night, all night long. And so it was, the attendance was just great, but I just thought it was a great, really great event that, again, the city didn't have you know, didn't have a part of other than, be, than, you know, I assume renting the space or allowing New Spring to use it, but it really showcased the park, I thought. And it was a great setting, and I'm sure they'll want to do it again. But. Ever since the permanent amphitheater was constructed, we have had an increasing number of yeah. both public and private events in the property ever since then. Yeah. Uh, and really took off ever uh, since the National Fireworks yeah, sure. Association was here. And when are we yeah. getting them back? That was quite a thing. So, that was, <laughs> there's a lot of factors at play with that. But um, oh, I hear a lot. Of the National Fireworks Association back. I should probably have a, on a little note card, I, and I don't, but 2021 was the, the year with the most usage day-wise, user days in the, in the Central Park for the amphitheater. Sure. As, as any before. And uh, it's very beneficial. Yeah. And I'll tell you, Yorktown looks beautiful. You know, I'm riding that oh, and all the yeah, it does. landscaping that's been done and the new entrance monument. I mean, it really makes the park look very professional. Did I read it right? That it looks like the a sidewalk is planned from 21st and Andover Road up to Cornerstone at some point. Maybe it looked like in the, this, I'm going back in the agenda i'm sorry yeah, that, that's in the 10-foot multimodal plan i'm pretty okay. sure neat thanks for coming andy yes sorry we're keeping you so you. late yeah yeah are you related to brad okay okay our do our his daughter and my daughter in the same class at school central christian well awesome yeah thank you very much for this evening um all right, let's wrap it up. Any member items for the good of the cause? And if not, then somebody adjourn, make a motion to adjourn us. Mr. Chairperson, I, Gary Israel, make a motion to adjourn the Planning Commission and Board of Zoning Appeals meeting for the 19th of October, 2021. Thank you, Gary. Do we have a second? Second made by Vance Carwood. Vance, thank you. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 
Aye. Any opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>